Over the course of a lifetime, without even thinking about it, we consume and rely upon thousands of products. From the mind-bogglingly complex to the elegantly straightforward. These everyday things are the culmination of brilliant brains working across history in cutting-edge science and design. Beat the horn! I'm Zoe Laughlin, designer, maker, and materials engineer. That's the nylon. And I love getting under the skin of the things we take for granted. I've studied them, but now I'm going to make my own versions. That looks surprisingly toothbrushy. To truly understand how form, function, and materials come together, with a bit of a smell, by pulling apart three seemingly ordinary but classic items. Oh before crafting my own designs, step by step. Release the balls! Oh, crikey. Vacuum on. Yes. And constructing something truly bespoke. They're mad, but they're mine. In this programme, I'm taking on an item so ubiquitous that most of us don't give it a moment's thought. The toothbrush. Various civilizations would have been using something like this around about 3,500 BC. Today's toothbrushes are packed with everything from 2,000 synthetic nylon bristles. There's a picker that picks up a bundle of the filaments. To innovative new materials. These are plastic granules made from sugar cane. But does it need to be this complicated? This one is sort of grotesque. Can I go back to basics? Fundamentally, we're, what we're trying to do is clean. And make the perfect toothbrush just for me. Brushing our teeth is hopefully something we all do. And it's quite mundane. But actually, when you delve into it, there's a bewildering array of extraordinary objects and materials involved in this process of keeping our mouth clean. To stand out from the crowd, manufacturers are constantly challenging the design status quo. But do these added features actually make a difference to our oral health? You could go as basic as your classic plastic toothbrush. Then you get hybrids like this that look very much like a manual brush, but you know, vibrates. Do they do any good? Who knows? But it's another thing to sell us. Bristles that are many different shapes. High-tech brushes that talk to apps and tell you you're doing it wrong. It's hard to separate the science from the marketing spiel, so I want to discover the thinking behind the origins of the toothbrush with a trip to the British Dental Museum. Hi, I'm Zoe. Hi, pleased to meet you, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Come on. Curator Rachel Bairstow is taking me through some of their hidden treasures preserved for posterity. How about this one? Bit of an experiment from the 1850s. <laughs> Sponge on a stick. <laughs> I like it. They hold a collection of over 25,000 different items. And there's a tiny cube. Tiny little toothpaste tube. I'm so close to tasting it, I won't. <laughs> All used at some point in history to help keep our gnashers in tip-top condition. So this is an 1878 treadle drill. 2,000 rotations a minute, come on, Zoe. Implement of torture. He's incredible now, you can do a filling. So what's known about the very earliest history of the toothbrush? Come and have a look at these. What were brushes like before they got so complicated? Here we have chew sticks. Various civilizations would have been using something like this around about 3,500 BC. And then that's the part you brush your teeth with? Yes. Incredible. In the depths of the museum's basement archive, lie more hidden historic dental delights. So take a look at these. <gasps> oh, now, these are recognisable toothbrushes. All shapes and styles. Before the late 1700s, if ordinary people wanted to clean their teeth, they'd use a rough cloth with powder like chalk or soot. Have a look at this one, very similar to one that William Addis invented in the 1780s. Who's William Addis? So he's a stationer and rag merchant. He was in prison um, for rioting and he'd been cleaning his teeth with a, a twig or some kind of cloth possibly, but he's trying to think of something better. So he fashions this piece of bone left over from his meal and he's going to find some bristles. Maybe it was from the mattress on the bed. So he's had his lamb chop, got a bit of mutton stuck in his teeth. He's looking at the bone and then 
makes a little broom for his mouth. And what a successful broom it turns out to be. William Addis went on to mass produce this tooth broom under the now familiar brand name Wisdom. And other companies were quick to follow suit. I love this one with its sort of zigzag pattern. Oh. That one will be Siberian pig bristle. And these bristles are much, much softer. That's a badger hair bristle, much more expensive. Only the wealthy could afford these brushes, with most people either doing nothing or just using rags. This one's a beautiful silver <gasps> toothbrush made by a silversmith in Birmingham in the 1790s. Wow, what an incredibly fine, delicate treasure. And you could change the head. By the turn of the 20th century, the nation's poor oral health came under the spotlight. What came next? The plastic revolution. The British Army realised their troops' teeth were so bad they couldn't eat their rations, and a national campaign was launched. Oh, and now you get colour as well. Oh, yes. Prompting a demand for cheaper brushes for all. This is celluloid from around 1906, 1908, and it was the high street shops that were beginning to sell these. Celluloid was one of the first thermoplastics, a group of polymers that soften and become pliable at high temperatures and solidify upon cooling. These qualities make it perfect for moulding into handles and rapid mass production. But these bristles, these are still... These are still animal bristles at this point because the next step forward is going to be nylon. So in 1938 in America, they developed nylon. Wow, so this is an entirely synthetic plastic blush in that you've got yep. plastic handle, plastic nylon bristles, cheap, easy to mass produce that can be easily dyed, that mean you get pops of colour. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> God, colour. Objects of appealing. desire. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And most importantly, they're more hygienic. Animal bristles of old harboured bacteria and took hours to dry. Bristle. No soggy bristles. These can dry out much more effectively. <laughs> This shift to cheaper and more hygienic synthetic materials played a massive role in improving the oral health of the entire nation. I love these ones with all the different neck shapes. But this swiftly led to an explosion of new products on the market, with manufacturers competing to stand out from the crowd. The biggest step forward in the last sort of 50 years has really been the introduction of the electric toothbrush. Few problems when they first came on the market. What I mean, problem? electricity in the bathroom, <laughs> you know, those kind of things. Oh, I like this one. Oh, I say, now <laughs> it's like a sort of spinning toilet brush. That's going to spin and throw toothpaste and spittle everywhere. Yeah, I don't think it caught on. No. <laughs> As toothbrushes have become more and more elaborate, I do wonder if we've gone too far. I'm curious to see if going back to first principles might produce a better brush. Let's start with handles. To find out what's really going on inside... Oh. That's the post that the toothbrush goes onto. It's time to pull them apart. This will be the motor, and then here's the battery. It's connected to the circuit boards. This is a complicated object, ultimately to perform a relatively simple task. Electric brushes are very effective cleaners, but I'm interested in the toothbrush in its most basic form. As human beings, we're so dexterous. But for me, a manual toothbrush is perfectly adequate. In terms of handles, often it's polypropylene or polyethylene. They're both thermoplastics that are very strong and durable. The polypropylene on this neck is great because it does have some flex to it, but it does not fatigue easily. Invented in 1954 for use in things like kitchen utensils, polypropylene is a plastic that's hard-wearing, long-lasting and easily cleaned. But <laughs> you've got a problem if you're brushing your teeth like this. Even though I haven't turned it entirely back on itself, it's not snapped. Compare that to something more rigid, like a bamboo handle. Well, <laughs> that snaps first time. This brush combines two types of plastic. With no label to identify which is which, my soldering iron should help, thanks to their different melting points. That's melted and it's almost now sticky. So this section, polyethylene. Let's try the white plastic. Yeah, so that is melting much less easily. We have polypropylene and polyethylene just in this one part in order to have a transparent element. And then the rubber, it's got a nice squidgy kind of give to it and a dimpled texture. And then another texture and material there, 
There's a huge amount going on. I mean, this one is sort of grotesque. So more than six different parts to make just one manual brush, but that's a vast improvement on the 500 plus components in an electric one. Is all this stuff really necessary? I'm slightly daunted by the prospect of a toothbrush now because actually this is complexity masquerading as simplicity. Delivering great functionality in as simple a way as possible is often the key to successful design. For my brush, I want to discard the unnecessary and create something truly bespoke that does everything I need it to do. The three areas I want to tackle are the handle, the bristles, and the toothbrush's partner in crime, the toothpaste. I want my toothbrush to be as sustainable as possible, which very few commercially available ones are. We treat these everyday items as entirely disposable. In the UK, we throw away up to 200 million a year. All of these toothbrushes were found washed up on a beach in Hawaii. They've traveled huge distances. And when you look closely, you can see the different plastics are breaking down in different ways. The sort of rubbery grip has now gone really sticky and crumbly and weird. It's sort of interesting, but horrific at the same time. Many plastic toothbrushes made since the 1930s are still out in the world somewhere. It is possible for handles made out of a single material to be recycled. But when you make it out of multiple different types of plastics like this, it actually becomes impossible to recycle. So what do you do with it when you finish with it? Well, if you put it in the bin, that's either going into landfill or worse, incineration. And if it's not disposed of with care, actually it can end up in the oceans as these did. I don't want my toothbrush to end up like that. So I've come to Malmo, Sweden, to visit TP, one of Europe's leading toothbrush manufacturers who are pioneering brushes and in particular handles made in a more sustainable way. <laughs> Hi, Patrick. Hi, Zoe. Welcome to TP. Thanks for having me. What an amazing factory. It is. They produce tens of millions of toothbrushes a year, and 85% of them have a handle made of one material. Talking me through the manufacturing process is product development manager Patrick Warriors. Well, we start off uh, with this pellet. This is polypropylene, which is thermoplastic material, which is melted and then injected into a, a form, and it comes out as a toothbrush handle. What temperatures are you melting it at? It's it's several hundred degrees, mm. so it's, it's really hot. And it's a thermoplastic, so you can do that again exactly. if you get it wrong. When we're not satisfied with the result, we can take it back and grind it down mm. and recycle it. This stuff's really nice, though. Mm. The factory produces 19 different models of brush with a single material handle. So this is how the handles look like when they come out of the injection molding, all glossy. That's a really nice molding. Here you can also see that the, the holes where we attach the bristles are already pre-made from the injection molding. So we don't have to drill yeah. the holes. Yeah, and those holes are now ready for the bristles. They are. So this is where we attach the bristles. Oh! This machine powers through 22 brush heads a minute. The robot will pick up the handle and put it in what we call the turret. Uh -huh. And in this position, we uh, insert the bristles. Oh, that's lovely. Is that just nylon filament? This on nylon, exactly. 2,760 individual bristles are inserted into each head and held in place by metal staples. Wow, it's so fast. Green, 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 pink, 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 green, green. That's yeah. amazing. As long as the head is cut off first, the handle of the brush can be recycled when finished with. This is the latest member of our toothbrush family. It's a bio-based toothbrush. Oh. TP are also looking at ways to reduce their use of finite resources such as fossil fuels. So this handle is made out of a bio-based plastic in the... Bio-based polyethylene. Innovations director Helena and her team are focused on reducing the environmental impact of the manufacturing process itself. And so with a traditional polyethylene, the source of that would be crude oil. Yes. What's the source for this? Sugarcane material. Okay, sugarcane. What are the bristles made out of? Those are made of castor oil, so it's also a bio-based material. That's nice. That's really nice. 
Oil-based plastics are energy-intensive materials, producing up to six kilograms of CO2 for every one kilogram of plastic, and they depend on dwindling resources. Whereas, bio-based products like these rely on renewable crops. The carbon footprint of this is next to um, CO2 neutral, because um, we absorb or manage to absorb the uh, CO2 emissions by 95%. It's really interesting because it feels just like a standard plastic toothbrush, but it's ever so slightly softer, is it? Yeah, I can't really describe you can it. You say it's slightly softer. Yeah. yeah. And it feels robust and sturdy, with a little bit of flex, which is good. And that's really key when we're changing to more sustainable material, I'm not compromising on the quality or the user requirements of the product. Just like in Sweden, I want to make my handle out of a single material. The question is, which? I'm going to run a few tests. I want to make some really just basic prototypes, and I'm interested in seeing what happens if all I do is change the material. How does the feel of the handle shift? Do different materials feel better, worse, robust enough, durable enough? So the first I'm going to try is a metal. This specifically is pewter, which is a low-melt alloy, mostly comprising of tin, really hard-wearing. I'm going to try also a silicon rubber. It has some give to it. It's actually quite a robust material, but with a little bit of flex. And then polyester resin, a plastic which is really hard, won't be very flexible, but is going to be smooth, easily cleaned. With a bit of help from my favourite childhood toy, I've made a mould using a multi-material handled brush as my master shape. Now, what's going on in here is pewter is being heated up to 274 degrees Celsius, much hotter than a domestic oven can get. It's actually not as hot as something like steel, where you'd need to take it to well over 1,000 degrees. So this is something I can kind of play with in a DIY way. Pewter has been used for making objects for more than 2,000 years. Here we go. It was mainly used for candlestick holders, tableware and jewellery. Don't knock it over, Zoe. Next, the silicon rubber. Now time to mix. <laughs> it's quite stiff. It's a chemical compound containing carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and silicon molecules. When bonded together, they make a polymer. Here it comes. It can be engineered to have a wide range of properties, from flexible and soft to robust and strong. Oh, God. The hole into the neck is too small. It's just whether it's going in all the way. There's no way of knowing. It's not an easy substance to delicately mould. Making things is always trial and error. Hmm. Finally, the polyester resin. It begins life as quite a viscous liquid, and I need to add a catalyst. Polyester resins are all around us. The catalyst is the agent that's going to cause a chemical change. 3%, so that will be 3 grams. They can be spun into fibres for clothing, moulded into plastic bottles, or used to make photographic film. Ooh, got to leave that, let it sit. Right, the moment of truth. Oh, this is exciting. OK, first the pewter. <gasps> Ooh! Oh, it's like an elegant fish. Next, the silicon rubber. Ugh, the rubber's bonded rather well to the mould. Really stuck. It's not good. I think this is a resolute fail. And finally, the polyester resin. Oh, that's very convincingly a plastic toothbrush handle. Oh, I like that. The polyester resin has picked up really nicely the tiny textured dimples on the surface of this. It feels like a good grip, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's a bit too plasticky. The metal one's got a real elegance about it. I like the idea of using something that says this is for life, this material makes it precious, but actually would it feel, in brushing your teeth, just too heavy? I'm not sure either the pewter or the polyester resin are right for my brush, but there's something really pleasing about seeing the same shape in different materials and realising that when you change the material, you actually do change what the object is like. But there's no getting away from it. The material and the shape in which it's formed are inextricably linked. For me, the feel of a handle is crucial for being able to use a toothbrush well. So for the next week, I want to test a range of shapes already available on the high street. That 
that feels good, but the head looks absolutely ginormous. It's like something you use for brushing the teeth of a horse. Next up, it's a simple polymer-handled brush. Now the shaft's a bit wet, it's actually more tricky to hold on to. It's sort of, my hand wants to move up and down it rather than the brush move with my hand. That will be nice, because my thumb will fit just there. I'm looking for a handle that's comfortable and easy to grip. It's getting there, but actually it's not there that I want it. A two material composite handle. This wasn't slipping, this was, I did have a good grip and a good purchase on this, but the downside of it is just you lose the ability to recycle. One alternative option is a handle made of bamboo, which could biodegrade in compost, and you would need to cut the head off. Do you know what? I don't like it. I think it must be highly porous. It's soaking up moisture and you can feel it wicking that moisture off your lips, off your gums, off your cheek. Morning. This morning, I'm going to try the Mizwak. Made from the branches of the Salvadora persica tree. True until brush-like. You can see where the bristles are starting to reveal themselves. The Mizwak is reminiscent of the chew sticks used by ancient civilizations and is thought to have natural antibacterial properties. The thing that I actually have liked most about this is the feel in the hand, because this is not slipping up and down. There's little ridges on the bark. I like that kink, and I feel clean. I love how the natural bumps of this handle provide a subtle yet successful grip. Maybe I should be looking to nature for inspiration. Something like this could be good. There's nice little nodules and knots. I'm rummaging through the autumn debris of the oak, hazel and mountain ash trees in a native woodland. I found this mad one with its budded end, which could be interesting for some kind of device. Oh, this one looks promising. Well, it's a good length already, but I like this nodule here. It feels like my little finger wants to locate itself on there. Feels good. I feel powerful. <laughs> With an idea for the shape of my handle, what else do I need to consider to ensure my brush does what my teeth need? I'm taking a slightly trepidatious trip to Hello. the dreaded dentist. Hi, I'm Zoe. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> no need to be anxious. Come and have a seat, my dear. Giving my teeth the once over is Dr. Swati Nahetti of Queen Mary's Hospital. Can you tell me a bit about teeth in general and then why it is we actually do need to clean them? OK, so let's start with what makes up a tooth. Mm. So you've got the enamel on the outside, which is one of the hardest tissues in the body. You've then got the dentine, and the periodontal tissue holds the tooth into the bone. OK. And there's cementum that lines the root surface. In the middle, the pink bit, is the pulp. So that's where the nerves are? That's where the nerves are. Now, any time you have a tooth in the mouth, you will get what we call a salivary pellicle. And the salivary pellicle is what will encourage bacteria to start to deposit onto the tooth surface. Brushing teeth really is about getting rid of the bacteria and debris from the tooth surface in order to keep the tooth healthy and the gums healthy. Crikey. Are you nice and comfortable there? Yeah, lovely. Open wide? Oh, oh. lovely. <laughs> Fantastic. So you seem to have lovely, healthy teeth. I hurry. But there's a little bit of plaque just on the back teeth there. I'm going to take a sample of your plaque for it to be examined under a microscope. So, plaque is the buildup of bacteria. It's a sticky mass which stays on the tooth surface and continues to grow. We've stained it with gram stain to show us the round um, microorganisms, as well as some rod-like bacteria and some corkscrew-shaped bacteria. And these are all part of a well-established piece of plaque. And especially these round bacteria here, they will use the sugars in your diet and starches in your diet as nutrients. So if we eat sugars or starches, then we are feeding that bacteria at the same it. time. Yes. What damage do they cause? The byproduct of their food processing is acid. This acid eats away at the tooth, causing decay. 
An acid attack on tooth enamel can come from acids in the food we eat. This is an ultrasonic scaler. Is it going to hurt? It shouldn't do. But it also comes from acids produced by bacteria as a byproduct of them feasting on starch and sugar remnants. <laughs> oh, I like that. So a good brushing is vital. I've never been so clean. When you go and buy a toothbrush in the shop, you'll find toothbrushes with all kinds of like nodules on and many different bristles and handle yeah. types. But ultimately, what makes for a good toothbrush? The ideal brush is a small head toothbrush to get to the far back of the mouth and off a medium hardness with bristles that are rounded. That's all we need. None of the fancy bits really make a difference. So the message is keep it small and simple. And I want to do just that. Next up, the bristles. OK. This one's got rubber on the side, different heights, different colours. Then you have things like this, which is a single bristle type. These are boar bristles. They're really stiff and wiry. Oh, it's a very gnarly surface. This is more like something you might, you know, clean mud off your shoe with. Despite the variety on offer, there is a common theme emerging amongst the majority of brushes. Yeah, they're nylon. Nylon, more nylon here. Nylon bristles are popular because they dry quickly, so bacteria can't live on them for long. They have enough stiffness to stand up, but can also be made soft enough so as to not damage the gums. Our friend, the multi-bristle head, there's three types of nylon bristle. A highly versatile synthetic fibre, nylon is a thermoplastic that has a wide range of applications. Invented more than 80 years ago, its first commercial use was for toothbrush bristles. Nylons around us all the time. We have these things, nylons, as in tights, often made of very thin nylon filaments. But you can also get nylon in pellet form. And you can even get totally solid pieces of nylon, great for making very intricate parts, used a lot in engineering. Originally marketed as a miracle material that was stronger than steel and better than silk, it was the ability of nylon to be drawn out into thin filaments that made it perfect for the bristles of a toothbrush. And I'm going to have a go at that now. Right, first things first, gloves. Nylon is made by combining two chemicals, a sebacoil chloride and a diamino hexane. The ingredients themselves look a little bit nasty, so specs on. Just going to empty all of the diamine hexane into this first beaker, and then this sebacol chloride into a separate beaker. They can be corrosive individually, but stabilise when mixed together. OK, and then the next step involves the glass rod. This allows me to gently pour the sebacol chloride onto the diamino hexane, creating a thin layer. Yeah. Now, that junction where the two liquids are meeting that's where the nylon is forming. This is where amino groups in the diamino hexane molecules and the acyl chloride groups in the sebacoil chloride molecules bond together in a process known as polymerization to make a series of bigger molecules in a repeated chain like fashion. Oh, in fact, some nylon has already formed. It's almost like clouds. Let me see if I can grab it. <laughs> come on, out you come. I'm actually drawing a continuous filament from the interface of the two liquids. Let me try something. On an industrial scale, manufacturers can create kilometres of this an hour. What? There it comes. At around a fifth of a millimetre thick. There we have it, homemade nylon. A way to go for me, then. The stuff that's the basis of the majority of our toothbrush bristles. A great material for my DIY brush. But there's one crucial element I still need to tackle. Surprisingly hard work. <laughs> How to attach them to my toothbrush head. So that's a metal binding that's holding the bristles in place. A feature of the vast majority of heads, these bindings are nigh on impossible to separate from the plastic, meaning the brushes can't be melted down and recycled. Now, this is interesting because I can't see the metal bindings. In this case, it really is like the hard plastic head has been directly moulded onto the bristles. 
This is a really intricately made, complex object that really is only possible with industrial manufacturing processes. Of the thousands of brushes on the market, I'm yet to come across one that's fully recyclable. So I'm on a mission to make mine just that. Can I mould the entire thing, handle and bristles as one single piece, dispensing of the need to join them together? To do that, I'm turning to a technology that will allow me to manipulate materials in an entirely unique way. Hi, Zoe. Hi there. Lovely to meet you. Thanks for having me. Andrew come Darwood, on, a dental surgeon with over 30 years' experience, helpfully also set up Additive, a company specialising in 3D scanning and printing. This is where it all happens? Yes. What we're doing is making your ideas into a physical reality. His team of designers use this technique to create a range of products, from architectural scale models to exact replicas of bones and teeth for doctors and dentists. So what we've got here is uh, Tom scanning an object with a structured light scanner and it has LEDs flashing very, very fast that project a structured pattern onto the object. So the LEDs throw a net of light over the surface of the object. Exactly. It actually has five cameras, and then the software works out a 3D shape for the object. This process is known as structured light scanning. That bottle has a very smooth surface. How well does the scan deal with textures? Could it pick up much detail? So we can get a resolution of about 0.1 millimetres. So that's, that's pretty small. Yeah, pretty that's accurate. really a tenth of a millimetre. is yeah, quite fine. Really good. Andrew's machine uses a technique called selective laser sintering. It's essentially an oven with a container full of nylon powder in it. The bonding process happens at a molecular level. The laser heats the nylon particles so fast that they become thermally activated and join together where they touch. The temperature is raised to just below the melting point of the powder. A laser scans across the surface and just tips the temperature up to the melting point of the powder, fusing the nylon powder together into a solid layer. Very it's measured process absolutely. as well. Absolutely. The powder bed drops down, another layer of powders wiped across, and those layers are printed one after the other on top of each other. And there we can, I can see the arm going across, uh, like a zen garden, just exactly. drawing across the surface, making it anew again. The printed objects are left to cool in their surrounding powder for up to 10 hours. So here's something else they made earlier. I think these are actually camera viewfinders. <laughs> I just love it. Fantastic. I think these tools and processes can help me with my build, although the inspiration for my brush might not be quite what the team are expecting. So these are my sticks, and I've got a few features of them that I think are really interesting. So this one, I think, is a nice all-rounder, great length and is got interesting nodules, get a good bit of purchase on it, have a hold. So many things now, you know, any lump and bump gets smoothed off. Yeah, but smooth and wet, you know, exactly doesn't does necessarily go together, does no. it? On the subject of texture, I also found sticks with lichen on, and suddenly I was reminded of these gel pads they'll mm. have on the handle. It's also got that element of softness to it. But this one's also nice. It's got these sort of buddy bits at the end, and I thought it already looks like something you'd be, like, <laughs> picking your teeth with. Yeah, you could definitely shove that in your mouth. For me, the ideal position would be to make the entire brush, bristles and all, out of one material. You could definitely print bristles, but whether current technology is good enough for it to be better than yeah. what's currently out there is, is another question. The challenge for the current best 3D printing technology is to make the bristles fine and flexible enough. Luckily, Andrew's years of dental experience suggest a surprising alternative. Have you ever gone abroad and forgotten your toothbrush? <laughs> Pick up a towel and you treat it like a toothbrush. It's remarkably effective. I like that. I could make a pack of 20 little pads. They would just go through the washing machine on a hot wash. You put a fresh pair of socks on every day. Why not yeah. put a fresh pad fresh. on your brush? Yeah. Just yeah. cover the stick with a sock. Rather yes. than thinking of a pad, it could be yes. a sock that slides Actually, over. Actually, that'd be brilliant, yeah. You know, fundamentally, we're, what we're trying to do is clean. And so what are the things that we use every day to clean with? Sponges, cloths, brushes. A little scouring pad, that's what we want. A mini. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if 
I can make a reusable sock, my toothbrush won't need replacing every three months. But what material should I choose? We've got a number of different cloths here. Some cloths are going to be really absorbent and soft. Others might be really coarse, but good at abrading away any food debris. This smooth and sturdy boiler suit cotton has large, closely woven fibres. Compare it to this flannel, which is also cotton, but treated in a very different way. Here the fibres are twisted and then looped. There's a lot of surface area here, which could be beneficial for cleaning. Microfiber cloths have a similar fluffy pile, but are made of a synthetic material. In fact, under the microscope, suddenly you can see that kind of shiny plastic finish to the fibres. This nylon sheet has an incredibly homogeneous uniform structure. The sort of fabric where water will roll off, but then on the other end of the textural spectrum is this hessian sack material. The natural fibres are very rough and coarse, so it could be good at scrubbing, but actually, is it going to be too rough? They're all so different, but how well do they clean? Time for the chocolate spread test. Delicious. This experiment will hopefully show me how well each cloth cleans visible dirt. Ooh. I've wrapped my five cloths around a block of wood to ensure the dimensions of each sample are the same. And then to try and compare those fabrics to toothbrush bristles themselves, I've mounted a few heads on one of the wooden tiles as well. Little spray of water. Real channels where the bristles were. Where the bristles weren't, not touched it. Not bad. The hessian, you can see the roughness of it, but from the start to the end, there's smearage. Now the nylon. It's a very even slick, but from start to finish, there is still chocolate spread on the tile. Next is the synthetic microfiber cloth. Now, this is an impressive start. It's completely cleared this section at the beginning, but then it sort of dumped it at the end. Cotton flannel. Ooh. It has picked up more than the microfiber cloth, and more is clinging to this. And then finally, the boiler suit cotton. Not bad either, but it hasn't cleaned it as perfectly at the start. There's more of a tail of smear. Surprised, actually, how different they are. So, for visible dirt, it's the two fluffier fabrics with their looped weaves and large surface areas out in front. But what about the stuff we can't see? Back of the spoon, little dab on the tile. Beep. My second experiment is designed to look at how well each material is able to remove invisible residues like sugars. The nylon, it's so unabsorbent that I'm just moving water around. <laughs> The things left behind in our teeth, which can feed bacteria and lead to corrosion. In this case, honey. And then the brushes. These hygiene swabs contain a liquid that will turn green if glucose from the honey is detected. Oh, instantly green and quite dark. The darker the green, the more glucose is left behind by the cloths. I'd say that's going the light green colour, so there is less glucose present. Oh, yes. I feel a dark one coming on. Plenty of glucose there. The results show a distinct difference. I think it's clear that these three are much darker than those three. The nylon, hessian sac and bristles all show a high level of glucose is still present after cleaning. It's interesting when you start to look at the two fluffier materials, the microfiber cloth and the cotton toweling. And I think if I compare it to the boiler suit cotton, mm, it's close. This one is quite similar to this. To my eye, the winner that is visibly lighter in its green colour, indicating a lower level of glucose present, is the cotton toweling. This one, I'd say, cleans the best. One last thing, however. How does it feel against my gums? I mean, it's weird, but it's soft, it's fine. Mm. Mm, I actually do feel quite clean. The toothbrush goes hand in hand with the toothpaste, and just like brushes, pastes have become bewilderingly fancy. You get things marketed to fill gaps and brighten and whiten and solve every problem that you may have. There's even things like this extraordinary whitening crystal chalk chip toothpaste, toothpaste lollipops. I have to give those a try. But what really is going on inside here? What ingredients, what properties do we want this material to have? 
Let's have a look. Aqua, water. Hydrated silica, sorbitol. Aloe vera, hydrated starch. The most popular brands average around 18 ingredients each. Xanthi gum, bicarbonate of soda. But do I need them all? A few key substances come up again and again. Sodium lauryl sulfate, sodium lauryl sulfate, and another sodium lauryl sulfate. This is a surfactant, a chemical that lowers the surface tension of a liquid, which can allow bubbles to form. Sodium lauryl sulfate is such a powerful foaming agent that if I just add a small amount of it to some peanut butter, a bit of water, it's going to be a bit gross. Hang on, bear with me. It's really getting frothy now. We don't actually need our paste to froth. It's just what we are used to. This is really strange. Although I know this is just peanut butter, the sensation of the foaming agent did make it feel so much like a regular toothpaste. But it's a potential for my paste because it can also damage the cell walls of bacteria. Glycerin, glycerin, glycerin. This is glycerin, a rather viscous liquid. It's a humectant, which likes to hold onto moisture, so it makes sure the paste is sort of pasty and that when you squeeze it, it can sort of glide out of the tube. Another useful ingredient. Most toothpastes contain an abrasive agent to help remove the buildup of plaque. And a really common abrasive is this stuff, calcium carbonate, which is just chalk. Abrasive agents can range from the very fine, like the chalk, to more gritty ones, like activated charcoal. Activated charcoal is highly adsorbent. Now, this is because of its microporous structure. It has lots and lots and lots of tiny holes. Just one gram has a surface area of around 2,000 square metres. I can demonstrate its adsorbent qualities by adding blue dye to two separate beakers of water and stirring charcoal into one of them. And then leave it. 40 minutes later... Oh, yes. It's cleared every trace of the blue. But under the microscope, we can see just how gritty a charcoal-based toothpaste can be. Oh, looks almost full of shards, like sharp grit. Wow, that's rough. I'm not sure I'd want that on my teeth. The one ingredient I am keen to add to my toothpaste is fluoride, a mineral that has been proven to be one of the most effective ways of preventing tooth decay and I'm just going to dissolve some in water. I'll give that a stir. Found in most toothpastes, fluoride's powerful properties help repair damaged tooth enamel, but also provide a protective barrier against corrosion from bacterial acids. I've got two eggs. One, I'm going to coat with the fluoride by just dropping it gently into the fluoride solution. Similar to the enamel of our teeth, the shell of an egg is vulnerable to acid and could, in theory, be protected by fluoride. So this egg is hopefully now coated in a layer of fluoride. And this uncoated egg is the equivalent of a tooth that hasn't got the coating of fluoride. I'm going to now put both of these eggs into white vinegar. With a pH of around 2.5, white vinegar is acidic enough to damage teeth and eggshells. In fact, Almost immediately, bubbles are forming on the surface of this uncoated egg. The calcium carbonate in the eggshell is reacting with the vinegar. Very quickly, this egg is starting to dissolve. Whilst the egg coated in fluoride... Nothing. If left in acid overnight, the shell would completely dissolve. It's a marked difference. It's pretty impressive, really. But even brushing twice a day with a fluoride paste doesn't provide round-the-clock protection, as fluoride washes away over the course of a day. Oh, Robert. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Nice Professor Robert Hill and his team at Queen Mary's University have invented a new material to create an even better fluoride barrier. What we've developed is a special uh, bioactive glass that dissolves in the saliva, and as it dissolves, it releases the fluoride. So your fluoride is embedded in the glass? Yes, and the glass is designed to stick to the teeth, so you get slow delivery over 10 to 12 hours. So you've developed what sounds to me like a magic ingredient. And, and you could say, if you like the word, that it's a smart material. <laughs> <laughs> so glass being in the toothpaste 
might make people go, crikey, I'm not going to put glass in my mouth. But I imagine these are very small particles. Yes, the average particle size is, is about a tenth of the thickness of a human hair. How much like traditional glass that maybe we'd have in our windows, is it? If you made your window panes out of this glass, it would just dissolve when it, it rains. Rain. Yeah. They'd disappear. <laughs> This is the furnace room where the glass is going to be cast into water. I'm going to stand well back. Robert silicate glass encapsulates fluoride within its structure. The glass is heated to a temperature of around 1,400 degrees Celsius. Incredible molten amber liquid before being rapidly quenched in cold water, fracturing into hundreds of tiny fragments of glass like snow in the bottom of the bucket. It's quite heavy. The water is drained away, leaving behind gritty chunks. And we will now grind this glass to a fine powder that we can then use in a toothpaste. The particles will go through more than 10 hours of grinding to reach the required size for a toothpaste. You can feel the fine powder. Oh, that's quite gritty. In your world, that's gritty. In my <laughs> world, that's fine. But the magic properties of this bioglass don't stop at fluoride protection. Robert and his team have also added calcium and phosphate ions, two of the main minerals in tooth enamel. So in here we have our scanning electron microscope. These minerals mimic and attach to the tooth surface, delivering the fluoride, but that's not all. Here we have a picture of the dentinal tubules in, in a tooth. And, and these tubules become exposed as, as a result of the enamel that you've lost on the tooth surface. Without the enamel protection, substances like ice cream or hot soup can go right through these tubules to our nerves, causing pain and sensitivity. So the, the, the solution is to block these tubules, and this is what we've done with the bioglass. And here we have the, the same section, but now brushed with the bioglass toothpaste. So that's your special bioglass bunging up the holes. Bunging up the holes, that's right. Amazingly, the calcium and phosphate remineralize and restore the outer layer where the enamel has been worn away. So your bioglass is actually doing two things. It's releasing that protective fluoride, but it's also blocking those dentinal tubules. That's exactly right. Uh, and that makes it a very effective ingredient for toothpaste. Right now, this innovative material is only available in one range of paste. And at nearly four times the price of many high street brands, it doesn't come cheap but it offers an exciting future for the health of our teeth. I'm really thrilled because Robert's given me a little sachet of his bioglass powder. Magic stuff. And it's definitely going into my mixture. My next step is to figure out what I put my toothpaste in. The majority of toothpaste comes in tubes, and these tubes are mostly made from polyethylene. But it's not the same material all the way through. It's polyethylene on the outside and it's aluminium on the inside. Two materials. That's near impossible to recycle. But the problem with tubes made of just polyethylene is, although it's flexible, it's also relatively elastic and springs back. So actually, to get the most out of the tube, you need something to hold it closed. If we each throw away six of these tubes a year, that's 300 million in UK landfills. Trusty hacksaw. OK. Some packaging, like these pump systems... Ooh! Well, that is a gloopy mess. ..are even more complex. I push this all the way up. Whoop. So this is the bung. And there are these kind of aluminium feet that bend in this direction, but not that direction. So it means it can slide that way, but not go back down. This is really well designed, but is it over-engineered? No one's really going to go to the trouble of getting the aluminium out of this widget in order to recycle that separately from that. Packaging like this will never allow me to make a sustainable product. In search of an alternative, I've come to visit one high street brand looking to push the boundaries when it comes to eco-friendly products. It smells amazing in here, really appetising. Mm -hmm. Helen Ambrosen is one of the product inventors and co-founders of cosmetics company Lush, where around half of their products can be taken home without any packaging at all. But how does that work for toothpaste? Here we have some toothy tabs, P3 
people, they're quite willing to try something different on their skin and their hair, but if you want them to put something in their mouths, you've got to get that just right. The bath bomb was the inspiration in terms of the ingredients that are used here. The combination of sodium bicarb and citric acid. So this is your sort of hero product, isn't it? Your archetypal bath bomb. Yes. One day in the lab, I decided to think about other organic acids and combined sodium bicarbonate with cream of tartar and created this. So these are essentially a tiny bath bomb yes. for your teeth. When you pop it in your mouth, your saliva and your wet toothbrush is providing exactly the right amount of water that you need to clean your teeth. An advantage of these tablets is they can be stored in any reusable airtight container you have to hand. It's lovely to be excited about toothpaste. <laughs> <laughs> in the mixing room, product makers Gary and Emmy combine all the dry ingredients. What you need to do now is make a nice little well in the middle. Like making a Yorkie pud. That's it. You got it. This is our mild surfactant, low sarcosin. So this is the foaming agent? Yep. This is lovely, unctuous. Very much like baking some sort of cake, making a dough. With the final ingredient, dicalcium phosphate, added as a mild abrasive, the mixture is given a proper stir. That's lovely. The next step is taste, and Lush pride themselves on being unconventional on this front. I'm going to give you some sad truth. Unfortunately, a lot of the material that make toothpaste effective actually taste horrible. <laughs> Product inventor Ali is showing me just why my toothpaste ingredients will need a flavour boost. Well, we start with baking soda. Tell me what you think. Well, it's a bit soapy, salty, in fact, metallic, even. Metallic, isn't it? Mm. But that is oh. Oh, really... it gets worse as but, well. Yeah. Luckily, Ali has an array of options to take the taste away. Peppermint essential oil is really what makes toothpaste taste like toothpaste. So, yeah, this is classic toothpaste. And I'm suddenly feeling like I've just brushed my teeth. And here we've got other materials that create different effects in your mouth. So we've got citron pepper extract, anethol and electric daisy, which I think you'll need to try. Please. So this comes from a toothache plant. Um, toothache plant? Yes, and it's like a little yellow flower with a red dot on top, but you just need to put it on the tip of your tongue. Ooh, tingly. <laughs> I almost want to put it up. In... I think that's a little bit too much. This is oh. neat. <laughs> No, I really like the electric daisy. I'm instantly thinking mixing it with something fruity. Yeah. That you could... Or with some lime oil. That's really good. Go on, do a double dip. It'll be loud. I'm, I'm, I might do this as well. That's nice. You've got the full fat lime and then bing in the middle. Dee, daisy. Yeah. Ah. With my final plans in place. Aha! Zoe, hi. hi, how are you? Good, thank you, how are you? Come on in. I'm back at the 3D printers to put Andrew and his team to work on my stick. I'm particularly interested in this texture of this lichen. OK. And then these little buds on the end of this the stick. Lovely bits. Yep. Cool, well, let's have a go. Using the structured light scanner... It's amazing to see great. it emerge on the yeah. screen out of nowhere. It looks like it's grown. <laughs> I've asked the team to print off a number of different prototypes to test out a variety of options for my head. So we've got that virtual object, and what we can now do is start to impose your ideas on it. So I'd like one stick to be made flat and smooth, and then another one that has... The knobbly bits. Yeah, knobbly bits. Another takes the texture of the lichen and places it on that face, and then bristles as thin as your nylon printer can make them. Exciting. Now it's down to the incredible precision laser to work its magic and heat the nylon particles. Several hours later, my sticks are ready. Dig in, see if you can find your objects. OK, in I go. Oh, it's very soft. Oh, I've hit solid. <laughs> I've hit solid. There is something... <gasps> Sticky! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> that looks surprisingly toothbrushy. It looks gorgeous. I really like the angulation of that head. Never yeah. seen a, a brush like that. So this is the one that's got the kind of... Knobbly bits. Knobbly bits from the other twig. This is the plain one. Yeah. 
sector. And this is the last one. So this is Uber Texture. Buds and lichen combo. This speaks to the future of an all one material yeah. brush that yeah. can be easily recycled. Yeah. Back in the workshop, I'm getting to work on my toothpaste, or rather, tooth tablets. The large granular ingredients are going in first because they'll need the most grinding. I'm keeping it simple with just six core ingredients plus some flavours. About a gram of the surfactant in the form of sodium lauryl sulfate, then xylitol, a sugar-free sweetener with antimicrobial properties. Next, a little bit of citric acid. So this is a binding agent, but it's also a mild preservative. Xanthan gum will also help it bind, and the bulk of the tablet is bicarbonate of soda. It's actually a very mild abrasive, so I need 50 grams of this. Next is the futuristic bioglass. This amazing time-lapse fluoride-releasing glass. This has got to be in there. Now it gets fun. OK. Last but not least, the flavours. A drop of electric daisy, a dash of lime. Let's do it Jamie Oliver style. Just a whisper. Let's try it. Mmm, tingly. That's nice. Right, hammer time. <laughs> Ta-da! Wow. I'm pleasantly surprised. My final task is the toweling booties. Maybe glasses on to be on the safe side. Ooh. I'm making a selection so I can have a fresh one every day. <laughs> it's like a fluff ball. <laughs> Right, the moment of tooth. Of truth. Time to test my four different 3D printed sticks, starting with the bristles. I think these bristles are too aggressive. These bristles just aren't fine enough. It was worth a try, but current technology isn't quite there yet to allow us to print the resolution needed for soft, comfortable bristles. This one doesn't have any texture on the head at all. It's just going to have the little toweling booty. Let's see what it's like with my homemade tooth tablets. Such a good texture. Crumbly, light, refreshing flavour. But there's a problem. This is too smooth. The toweling sock just slides off there. Maybe the booty will stay on with a rougher head. It's so unusual, but... That's quite good. The toweling is nice, but maybe those nobbles are too much. Finally, it's the fully textured head with buds on one side and lichen on the other. That's better. So that lichen texture, it's enough to stop the booty sliding off. I mean, I know it's bonkers. I never would have set out to make a toothbrush that looked like this. It's such a joy. I know it's silly, but a stick is such a powerful thing to hold. There is nothing like this in the world. It's genuinely unique. It feels terrific. And I really do like the little flannel sock that slides over the top. Have a number of them, throw them in the washing machine. Bob's your uncle, booties your toothbrush, and you're ready to go. And then, of course, the tooth tablets. <sighs> smells so good. It's a dream combination. And a brush I'll have for life. Next time, I'm taking on an item I cannot live without. Headphones. A uniquely combined design and technology. Four pins of this material and a couple of AA batteries would lift a car. Impressive. Can you still hear me? Can you hear me? It's great. But can I make a homemade version? That's the whole vacuum on that really makes some noise. Starting to feel a bit headphony. If you want to explore further, watch additional experiments and learn more about material properties and design thinking. Go to the address on screen and follow the links to the Open University.